day in Manhattan Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions, but it was not discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared Drop the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by a plane They say it was a fire Yet you can't see the flame Cascading projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition, but it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes The bigger the lie, the more people believe And the deeper the fear, the more easily we are deceived I Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusion Sharing the truth about 9-11. Well, welcome to the last show of the year. And starting uh, in January, every single Saturday. That's right. 9-11 was an inside job and other state crimes against democracy will be live at 5 on Channel 11 every Saturday. All right. Break out the champagne. In the meantime, we've got a lot that's going wrong in this country. But think about this. The polls show that public opinion is diametrically opposed to almost every single policy we have, and yet people still talk about, oh, we live in a democracy where people rule. Well, that's a lie, obviously. But we do have the power, and it's when you turn around and say, oh, what can I do, that you've purposely crippled yourself. We have the power. We saw it when the whole world made Obama back down from the aggressive attack of Syria. Okay, well, there's been a lot going on. We know that the NSA is illegally spying on us, and just recently there was a courageous judge who decided to abandon his political and economic future by 
actually upholding the Constitution and saying that the NSA was performing unconstitutional actions. Well, the ACLU has been active on this subject and they've put out a little video that we're going to watch now and it's called The NSA is Coming to Town. Ah, the holiday season. A time for celebration, magic, and spending time with the people you love. But don't forget who's watching to make sure you're not being naughty. You better watch out, you better not Skype, you better log out, yeah, you better not type. The NSA is coming to town. You're making a list, they're checking it twice, they're watching almost every electronic device. The NSA is coming to town. They see when you are sleeping, they hear while you're awake. They know who you call and who you write, so encrypt for goodness sake. With Congress in the dark and a cloak and dagger court, we're looking for answers and they're coming up short. The NSA is coming to town. They're making a list, checking it twice. They're watching almost every electronic device. The NSA is coming to town. The NSA is coming to town. The NSA is coming to town. You wouldn't let government agents spy on your special holiday moments in person. Why are we letting them do it in the digital world? Help us end the NSA's unlawful spying programs. Click here and take action now. Well, obviously you can't click there because this is a TV show, but uh, if you were watching that on the internet, when you click there, you'd be headed off to the ACLU website, which I recommend that all of you do. Um, the next step, we're going to watch a video about the, uh, the scandal that's been brewing for the last six months, whatever. Um, if you recall, Back when Julian Assange and WikiLeaks were in the headlines, another thing made the headlines, and that was that PayPal had moved to block all credit card donations to WikiLeaks. That means the Visa, the Master Charge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They blocked it. They had no right to do that. They, they, you know, people say in their defense that they were being pressured by the government, and perhaps even blackmailed, who knows. But here's the scandal. Now we have... Uh, Edward Snowden, steal, well, depending on your sources, they, they, the government first said they stole 50,000 documents, so, and then later on, 1.7 million, I've heard 2 million documents, but the problem is that only 1% or less than 1% of those documents have been released, and it's been long enough now for you know it to be completely gone through. Um, not, not only that, but Edward Snowden completely went through it already and completely categorized every one of the documents so that you could look at his outline as a beginning point. But they didn't do that. Now here's the scandal. Glenn Greenwald, who, you know, I've been showing lots of clips from Glenn Greenwald. I think he's one of the most eloquent speakers. And to the point, I mean, he's right on when he's talking about all this stuff. So you can't fault him that way, but he's partnered up with a strange bedfellow, the owner of PayPal, the billionaire owner of PayPal, the one who already withheld, you know, uh, donations from other whistleblowers. And now here's the scandal. He's putting up a quarter of a billion dollars to form an alternative media with Glenn Greenwald and another person who you might have heard of, Jeremy Scahill. You've seen him 
on Democracy Now! an awful lot. Keep in mind that Democracy Now! is, you know, basically, uh, they're controlled by the economic arm of the CIA through the Ford Foundation grants and other uh, foundations. And you can see in the history of Democracy Now! the subjects that they avoid and the subjects they don't avoid. And it kind of tells you about what the government is sensitive about. If, the, if democracy now is talking about it, the government isn't particularly sensitive, or I shouldn't say the government, because remember, our government is not the top of the chain, not the top of the food chain. The government is the tool for uh, procuring profit for the corporations. As long as you understand that, it makes a lot more sense, because how can people keep sitting there we know what we want, but we never get it. We, we now know that the polls show that almost everything that there's a majority for, 50, 60, 80 percent majority, doesn't matter because it's the corporate interest that matters. So when they talk about democracy or representative government, just say, you're lying. You know, it's not that way, but we would like to return it to that. Well, Sibel Edmonds, the most classified woman in history, has... Uh, She's the, the first person to really spot this and, and bring, bring out the, the issue. And if you haven't been to BoilingFrogsPostBlog.com, uh, I think that's all of it anyway, um, you need to go there at Sabelle Edmonds. You'll find it easily when you start looking on the internet. But um, she's got a, a kind of a a panel of two other people, James uh, Corbett, and I forgot the other guy's name, but you'll see in just a minute. But we're going to play maybe 30 minutes of their debate about this uh, Snowden, Greenwald, Skay Hill, PayPal scandal. And then I'll be back with a free speech zone. Like, okay, let's just have a real talk, real talk, uh, no censorship. Welcome to another edition of BFP Roundtable here on BoilingFrogsPost.com. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and today we are joined by Sibel Edmonds, of course, the founder and editor of Boiling Frogs Post, as well as Guillermo Jimenez of the Traces of Reality radio show and podcast at TracesOfReality.com. Uh, Guillermo, Sibel, great to have you to here today to discuss a very interesting and very timely topic that has been making headlines around the alternative media uh, blogosphere, and that is a series of articles that Sabelle Edmonds has been posting to BoilingFrogsPost.com examining the Glenn Greenwald slash Pierre Omidyar slash PayPal slash NSA scandal? Well, I don't know. Well, let's, let's put a question mark next to that for now and let's start putting um, some of the analysis out there on the table. So for those of you who have not been following this article series, of course, we will encourage you to go to BoilingFrogsPost.com and take a look at these articles, starting with the article that came out on December 8th called Checkbook Journalism and Leaking to the Highest Bidders, in which Sibel started to lay out a case that Glenn Greenwald's reporting on the Edward Snowden affair, it may not be what it appears to be. And we're looking at a number of different angles today, and one of them is a an NSA insider source that has uh, indicated to Sibel that apparently uh, there was PayPal information that was specifically contained in the uh, in the documents in the Snowden documents that were leaked out um, that have not been leaked to the general public via Glenn Greenwald who is acting as the leak keeper. Um, and this is significant because for those of you who do not know, Glenn Greenwald recently formed a new news uh, media partnership with Piero Midiar, the co-founder of eBay and thus one of the top executives at PayPal. This is all a very interesting and very incestuous circle and it's, uh, it's extremely provocative and has generated a lot of response from people on both sides of this issue, people, people who are both skeptical of Greenwald and people who are not. So let's start getting into some of the uh, the the nitty-gritty of this. And, uh, Sabelle, let's start with yourself. Um, first of all, if there's anything I mischaracterized there in what I said, please let us know. And secondly, tell us basically what, what it is that you're, you're trying to drive at with, with this article series. 
<clears throat> well, I'm going to try, but first I have to make sure I'm trying it without too much laughing or smiling, which I usually engage in. I still have many stitches inside my mouth. I had a surgery, and so if you notice some kind of awkward and uh, weird features or mimics or whatever here, please forgive me. <laughs> I haven't recuperated yet, and it's hard not to smile and laugh, and I'm with people I really enjoy being with. But uh, th several big reasons, uh, major reasons, I start with one, and that is because the case deals with a whistleblower. And the case from the beginning has been characterized as a whistleblowing case, and it may very well be. I don't know that. Uh, for the past six months, uh, people have contacted me, asked me to put forth opinion and, uh, and, and my stand on Edward Snowden, and I have always characterized the action in terms of the bravery that it takes, and it takes a lot of that, if, if everything is real, to obtain these documents because, one, the person believes that the, uh, the public uh, is entitled to have this information, two, that the government is engaged in illegalities, criminalities that they are covering up. So for those noble purposes, pure purposes, if this person is gutsy enough to get those documents, to give it to the public and say, here it is, you need to know what your government is doing, okay? Then absolutely, I, I support that person, I support Manning, I support anyone who has that much guts and who is that I know I don't like the word patriotic, but let's say patriotic in terms of they, he wants to serve his, uh, you know, people, his nation. But I, I, I kept saying I don't have enough details to form any, you know, conclusive opinion because I'm still looking at this case. And the more time started to pass and the more I started reading and the more I started seeing and the more I started hearing, uh, he, the case became more and more convoluted. And you mentioned those points, and that is the fact that all documents were turned over to Glenn Greenwald and, and uh, Poitras. B, well, within two months, less than two months of that happening in June, in August, Greenwald signs a book, multi-million dollar, gives a promise to the publisher that he's going to sit on some of this information and make it exclusive to the book to make it a bestseller, okay? And the fact that the other two people who have gotten book deals from Washington Post and Guardian, because they got book deals too, they don't have what he has, so he's going to make sure that those documents are not released so the publisher will profit from it and he will deserve millions of dollars on that. And then a month later, he goes, and this is the man who for decades has been justifiably attacking the corporate media. Corporate media, well, we all attack. And, and he has been very outspoken. I have always saluted his stand on that. Suddenly, he makes a deal with the corporate man, Omidyar, PayPal and eBay owner, billionaire, for $250 million. And it is stated in all the interviews that the only reason Omidyar came to him, to Greenwald, and proposed this partnership so he would give him $250 million for this joint ventureship is that they would, meaning Omidyar's new company, Corporation News Corporation, would publish some of these documents. Well, suddenly, Glenn Greenwald began talking about corporate media is good, not bad. It was very, very bad. Now it is very, very good. <laughs> and, and, and the hypocrisy of it, and not only that, uh, the fact that none of the uh, conditions or the contracts for this uh, joint ventureship is known, well, that came out. And then the Hollywood studio deals for millions started leaking out. And I, all along, I haven't heard anything from the whistleblower, Edward Snowden. I have always emphasized through my organization for whistleblowers as a person, as a whistleblower myself, that whistleblowers have to be really wary about standing really, really pure in terms of don't get partisan because that would ruin your reputation because that will insert an agenda into your action, okay? Uh, do not engage with in situations of conflict of interest. So I, I have been preaching it, but I have also been practicing it myself. Well, in this case, this guy, Snowden, has given Glenn Greenwald all the documents saying, 
I leave it up to your judgment to do as you wish. Well, if his purpose to start with was obtaining those documents, the government is calling it stealing it, so that the public will get to know, yet giving it to a person that he has never met before, he doesn't even know personally and say, you do as you wish, that itself raises eyebrows. And I, I would say there are at least a dozen of points that raise eyebrows, but I want to pause here and I want to start getting specific discussions and questions from both of you, and then we'll get and delve deeper into this. All right, Guillermo, what's what's your thoughts on this? Any any specific questions that you want to ask Isabel? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, like, you know, as you said, so well, you raised a lot of really interesting points just now and throughout the series of your articles, uh, really important points. And uh, as, as you and I uh, discussed earlier, James, with along with uh, our friend Tom Sucker, we talked about this a few days ago, and we had a discussion about uh, what we thought about the, 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 the articles and the, the bigger issues regarding Greenwald, his, his now uh, you know, million-dollar deal with Omidyar and what that means. And as I said in the beginning, you know, when I first heard about you know, Greenwald leaving The Guardian, and starting up a new media venture. Initially, I was, I was intrigued. I was like, okay, well, this is interesting. Perhaps he's going to go at it independently. Wouldn't that be a great, a great thing to do? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be great? Uh, someone with, the, with Greenwald's uh, name and with that sort of uh, attraction that he brings uh, could, could very well go out and start up a new independent media venture. He doesn't really need millions of dollars. He's in a position where uh, if he went sort of the, the route that, that BFP has taken, say, you know, a subscription-based model. Uh, I ventured against a guess Greenwald and Scahill could round up quite a, quite a bit of, uh, of subscribers enough to to make a, a comfortable living. So, um, having said all that, you know, again, initially I, I was sort of torn by the by the by the sort of uh, story. Uh, as I started reading more, though, I started learning more about who this Pierre uh, Omidyar uh, is, his affiliations with PayPal. Uh, PayPal's uh, a role in uh, uh, going after WikiLeaks, for example, and and that really was the key to me. Is that okay? Let's put aside the the issue of money, which I'm sure you know when you attach again when you attach so many zeros at the end of a check, <laughs> that that's enough to change uh, anybody. Well, maybe not anybody, but enough to change a lot of people. Uh, perhaps even someone like a Greenwald, but. Let's put that aside for the moment and focus on, okay, well, look at this guy specifically, right? Pierre uh, Omidyar. Uh, there is a really obvious and very uh, clear conflict of interest there, right? Um, we, know, we know for a fact, well, I shouldn't say for a fact. We, we, have, a, we have a pretty good idea that, that PayPal does indeed cooperate with the NSA and Greedfall has, has admitted as much. He has said he has no doubt that PayPal does cooperate with the NSA. Which is something that's worth worth, worth grilling him on. If if that's true, as Sabel pointed out in one of her articles, uh, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you have no doubt that 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 is the case? Um, and if there is no doubt in your mind that that PayPal has cooperated with the NSA, and your new boss uh, owns PayPal, is that not a conflict of interest? And to date, uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, James or Sabelle, uh, I have not seen uh, Greenwald say anything to that effect, acknowledging the fact that it is a, a clearly a conflict of interest and what he plans to do about it. Now, if he had addressed it, instead of going the route that he did go, which we pointed out on the podcast we recorded, resorting to ad hominems and saying, oh, you're crazy, lunatic, stupid for even pointing this out, that I thought was, was very telling. So... Um, yeah, I guess that's my my sort of uh, take on this currently is is his his reaction to me said a lot. Uh, the fact that he won't acknowledge the really clear conflict of interest says a lot. Um, and the fact that like I said, he really I mean he doesn't need the millions of dollars. I, I said I said a couple of times on the on the radio show on the podcast that I, I don't think there's anything wrong with making money, even if it's a lot of money. Nothing inherently wrong with that. But for someone in Greenwald's position, uh, he doesn't really again need that. To, to move forward with his career. He's got, you know, again, the, the Glenn Greenwald brand firmly uh, built and firmly intact. So um, I don't know. What do you guys have to think about, have to say about that? I mean, I, I guess, again, he, I, I think he, you know, he didn't need this, but sh should he have turned it down? Could he have turned it down? What do you guys think? Uh, personally, <laughs> I would say that I find it um, uh, somewhat 
disturbing, as you say. Um, the the amount of money that's involved in this, I I can't imagine what Scahill and Greenwald and Poitras and friends need with a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> right. um, yeah. That's a, a, just a staggering sum of money, almost a mind blowing amount of money for a venture like this. So I, I again, I can't even imagine why they would think they would need that much for for what they're doing. But then again, we don't know what they're doing yet at this point. So right. we'll see what kind of uh, pseudo mainstream type of outlet they're going to come out with to try to compete with, I guess, the New York Times. I don't know what they're <laughs> really thinking they're going to do. Well, but James, um, yeah. that aside, uh, here's a specific question that I wanted to ask Sibel. Obviously, I, I understand you can't give away the the source that you used for for your original article on this. So Midiar's PayPal cor- cor- uh, Corporation said to be implicated in withheld NSA documents, but you did characterize that source as a retired NSA official and I to this uh, to this day I still wonder I, and I don't understand how a retired NSA official could have any indication what is in these Snowden documents even as the official line is that the NSA still doesn't even know exactly what uh, Snowden got his hands on that's what they're officially saying anyway so so how does he know this how how can we know that he um, has this information in the first place that's a valid that's a valid question. Before I answer that question, one other thing that we were talking about with PayPal is also uh, Greenwald's muddying and twisting and giving some really no answer answer on why doing this deal. He said, I'm doing it because we need attorneys, we need editors, and we need to have an establishment in order to publish these documents. Well, he had all that with Guardian. Guardian has dozens of attorneys. Uh, Greenwald was making high six figure with Guardian. So it was not that he was making peanuts and it was an establishment. Plus it was outside the United States. Now I still consider Guardian an establishment outlet. So to, the fact that he's giving this, he's saying, because I needed that to publish this, that's not true. Again, that is one thing that is being twisted. He had all that. And Guardian, they said they, it was unexpected. They were very surprised and they were very uh, upset that this, this took place. They wished them good luck. Now back to your question. The NSA uh, source that I have, and I had to delete the name of the division he worked with when he was there with the NSA. And also he is in touch with many other NSA people still. This person is not a whistleblower. He comfortably retired. However, he knows based on the contract works because this boils down to some software division within the NSA and it has a specific name. There's the division that had the contract with the place where he was working. Therefore, he knows the type of data and, and the system those contractors and that particular company would have had access with people with the high level clearance. And based on that, he knows that also that that division and that particular section contains all sorts of financial information that NSA has been gathering from not only PayPal, but from other credit card companies, from banks, not only international, but also domestic transactions. And again, this is another point with the number of documents. It was 8,000 documents. Then it became 12,000 documents. After that, it was now 50,000. Everybody's talking about 50,000. Then the NSA comes and says it's 2 million documents. <laughs> Nobody knows how many documents. And this story keeps changing as far as the documents are concerned. Another uh, inconsistent and also uh, twisted answers that Greenwald has been saying uh, and putting forth. He started, and there are several interviews, we have documented it, other people have documented it, when Greenwald said he spent so much time, he being Snowden, analyzing everything he gathered. He indexed them, he categorized them. In fact, he called it mother effort. So anal and so, we were shocked how he had every single page, okay? We are talking about tens of thousands of documents. Later, the same man, Greenwald, came and said, we still don't know what's in those documents, okay? There's so much. It's going to take years for us to know what is what, okay? These are, I mean, once you start getting into it and get all the information or maybe misinformation that Glenn Greenwald has been putting out there, putting them side by side in a matter of six months, then you go, something is seriously wrong here. 
Well, I, I agree that there is, uh, the more you dig into this and the more that you dig into the statements that have been made about the documents, the way they've been handled, the way that they're being uh, distributed, um, there are so many contradictions that uh, that don't become apparent until you start trying to sort through all these different statements that have been made at different times. So it's difficult to even know what the official word on this is at any given time. But uh, just a, a, another connection to add to this mix that I, 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 I found recently that really, I think think um, has really settled it in my mind one way or another, is that not only, of course, is Omidyar directly connected to PayPal, being the co-founder of eBay and the largest shareholder in eBay and sitting as the chair of eBay, the parent company of PayPal, um, but also someone who is on the uh, uh, on the Omidyar network, which is, of course, Omidyar's organization, uh, Salvador Gambianco is also, uh, it turns out, a board member of Booz Allen Hamilton, the former employer of Edward Snowden, um, which is a pretty startling connection for the man who just paid $250 million to start a new uh, news gathering venture with the man who's supposedly reporting on Snowden's leaks. And again, I haven't heard a peep out of Glenn Greenwald about this connection and about the, uh, the, the implications of this. He has, of course, given some sort of kind of blanket denial that uh, that there's anything wrong with partnering with this billionaire and that this man is a wonderful virtuous uh, civil liberties crusader but he hasn't addressed in specifics the uh, the, the PayPal connection and uh, the the other connections to Booz Allen Hamilton for example the, on the Omidyar network which Again, to my mind, I can't understand how anyone could see this and not be concerned about this, and how the public could not, at the very least, hold Greenwald's feet to the fire over this and demand more transparency over what documents he has and what time frame for release we're looking at here. Because as uh, uh, johnyoungcrypto.org posted um, last month, at the current rate of release, it will take 42 years to release all of the documents, assuming there's only 50,000 of them, let alone the 2 million of them or whatever they claim to have now. So uh, again, uh, there's so many different par- points to go here on here. Um, Guillermo, anything you, you wanted to add at this point? Yeah, as you said, James, there really are a, a lot of different points that we could focus on. I have a couple of things that, that, that uh, as you guys were talking, I found interesting and worthy uh, of sort of uh, expanding on. But the one thing that, that we have been talking back and forth about recently has been the strategy involved, whether, whether Greenwald should have dumped it all a uh, WikiLeaks style, the, the Snowden trope of documents, uh, whether or not his rationale for withholding some of the documents was legitimate. Uh, where, uh, saying, uh, that, you know, I have illegal reasons for why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Uh, I have, there, there's privacy concerns. Uh, it, the, 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 the documents may contain information that's, that's sensitive. They may contain uh, individuals' private uh, internet history or something like that. Uh, but Sibel raised the issue, which I found, I, I found compelling, which is, uh, yeah, we've heard that Snowden uh, was meticulous in his filing and his documenting and his cataloging of these documents. So if that's true, then one would think anyway that uh, he would have made sure that there was nothing like that that he was you know, handing over to Greenwald to begin with. So if that is true, if Snowden was so meticulous and, and really was really careful about what he, uh, you know, how he put it together – then there wouldn't, there shouldn't be any concern, um, legal or otherwise, about just releasing all the documents already. So that's one thing that I wanted to throw out there. Um, I also I wanted to address the the criticisms that uh, you, Sabel, have been receiving uh, over the the series of articles that you've written about Greenwald. Uh, one of the criticisms that I've that I've seen online, uh, I've seen it in, on Twitter <laughs> and all and that sort of stuff. Um, People accuse you of, of uh, carrying the NSA's water, of, of taking uh, the public's eyes off the prize, of focusing on Greenwald and Snowden rather than the NSA and what they're doing, uh, their surveillance. Um, so, I mean, I could probably even, uh, I mean, I, I, I could answer my own question, but I won't. I'll let you, I'll let you answer that uh, as far as uh, what you would say to those people uh, who, are, who are, you know, saying that this is what's going on. Um, what would you say about? Because I, why I'm saying this is because I was reminding of this recently when I was having a, a talk with uh, Vivian Wiseman. Yeah, sorry about that, Sabelle. I don't know. We try not to make you uh, smile or laugh too much. <laughs> but I was having a conversation on on, on the manufacturing consent with uh, Vivian Wiseman, and we were talking about uh, occupying. We we're talking about uh, COINTELPRO and the Black Panthers, and I was reminded of something that. Uh, uh, my friend Larry Pinkney has reminded me of several times, which is the old school, like Chicago uh, style uh, Black Panther mentality of 
never attacking other activists is sort of like their motto, their mantra. You never go after anyone who you consider to be on the same side or same team. You, you have a united front and you go after the ones who really deserve it. <coughs> now, what I would say to that is what happens when someone who was you know, supposed to be on our side is now potentially in, in league with you know, the, the state, the, the, the surveillance state. Oh, I think that kind of changes things a little bit, and maybe they do deserve some criticizing publicly. But anyway, I'll throw it to you, Sabelle, and maybe you can address some of those critics. Great. Well, you have two points. Uh, I just want to quickly add one other thing to your first point you made yep. about uh, Snowden going through all these documents, combing it through. Same thing with, uh, you know, Greenwald, of course. And not only that, to prove that, Greenwald's boyfriend, husband, partner, takes these documents, 50,000, 2 million, 1 million, in a laptop, and he's traveling, okay? It's safe enough for these documents in a file, in a laptop, to go to Germany, first class travel, by the way, these travel are all first class, then going to London, Heathrow, then we have that uh, lady, Poitras, he's throwing the globe, and he's going to New York Times building, he's taking cabs, he's carrying laptop that has 50,000 or 2 millions of documents. Glenn Greenwald, same thing, having all these travels going around the world with these documents. So if it's safe enough, okay, and if it's not sensitive at all for these documents, that these individuals, including the so-called journalist boyfriend, is traveling in the laptop carrying these documents, I tell you, if that's the case, there is nothing important in there. <laughs> That's one conclusion. I spoke with several other reporters. I said, would you do something like that? This is not during the initial stage. This is two, three months after the Alexander the Great was going to drone uh, Snowden. He was going to drone Greenwald. Their lives were in danger. Yet they're running around with these laptops through all these airports. And they're going to airport lounges with all these documents. And what the answer I'm getting is... Even people with borderline IQ, you know, so let's say you are, you know, not intelligent, even though I believe Greenwald is a genius, he's a shrewd, cunning, genius person, would not do it. Yet you see Greenwald and boyfriend and this woman and God knows how many people <laughs> trotting the globe with these millions of documents or 50,000 documents. That alone should tell people something really fishy is going on here. I would never do that. No respectable reporter would go around the world carrying laptop with sensitive documents that you don't know. Some of those may truly hurt us. We don't know, right? Because that's his justification line. I don't know. Some things there may really hurt us. So we have to bet. Hey, Guardian and Greenwald had over 100 meetings with FBI and the NSA and the White House people and the MI6. The guy testified, right? In Parliament in UK. So, okay. Let that's for that point. The second point with the attack, I don't think you kind of grow some sort of immunity to this because you don't, but after a while, you get to see the pattern. Within two months after Obama was elected, the first round, I wrote this article for Boiling Frog's Post, and it was titled something like the two sides of the same coin or something like that. And I was thinking how he's going to be just like Bush or even worse. And his track records contradicted in many ways everything that he was promising, the change, you know. And, uh, and, and also within the first few months, he started screwing the nation. I mean, royally screwing, okay? <laughs> I put this op-ed, my goodness, I had so many attacks. I was completely thrown out by people in Daily Coast who used to say Sabelle Edmonds is a hero. Sabelle Edmonds became a bitch. Uh, excuse my language. I don't know if I, that's a cuss word. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> Female dog. And, uh, and the same thing. How could you uh, say that? The man been in the office less than three months. Why don't you give him a chance? Don't you know he has to go and first clean up the mess George W. Bush left? He, they are making him, pressuring him. Uh, you can't jump and conclude this stuff about President Obama. Well, everything I concluded, everything I put in there, I, I ended up proving to be correct. And not only that, much, much worse, okay? So even six, seven years after this, six years after that elections, to date, you still have that crowd 
who says this was the man of change. He still was. They must be doing it to him. They must make it. They're twisting, 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 twisting his arm, okay? And 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 uh, that that's unfortunately happens to be the psyche of the majority. We they are, I call it, I don't know if there is a syndrome for it. <laughs> I call it the Messiah seeking syndrome. They seek Messiah. Obama was the Messiah. Thou shall not dare criticize Obama. You do. Thou is a bitch. Thou is an evil. Now, the same thing started happening with Greenwald. People, they feel like they need this person who's going to be their savior. Greenwald the savior, Snowden the savior. Thou shall not quite question anything. And they are attacking and they are so blinded. They are so blinded that you can put 50 witnesses from the NSA. You can put so many documents. You can you can put all the one-on-one logic lines in front of them. They don't want to see it. No, because they want this to be true. Because this is what actually the mainstream media has been giving them. The picture that we have of Greenwald and his boyfriend and uh, Snowden, where have we gotten this picture? CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, GQ Magazine, CQ Magazine, just name them. You know, uh, the, this, these people, the ones that we've already declared as evil, these corporate media that they are in cahoots with the government and with the corporations, they are the ones who are providing us on what is Greenwald saying and his pictures and Edward Snowden. That's the information. So if our information is filtered through these corporations, and government, you know, government shills, shouldn't we be really examining and, and questioning and looking at that? Right now they are saying no, you know. Uh, and, and even if you put the past history of Glenn Greenwald, someone who is highly, not everybody is motivated to some degree by money, but somebody who is highly motivated by money, somebody who is highly motivated by fame, somebody who always has been, look at me, you know, I, I look at me, I'm here, I want you to look at me. Well, you put all that, you put all the different careers he has held, all of them in one place and says, what makes you, based on this track record, make turn this guy into Jesus Christ, to some sort of Messiah? I mean, what has given you that indication? They would have, and they don't, well, you know what? Maybe he sinned in the past, but he found, he found God. Same thing with Omidyar. The guy has been screwing whistleblowers. His partners, they are saying openly, they love the NSA and what NSA is doing. It's all documented. And Omidyar says, doesn't matter. I found God through Greenwald, okay? So one of them is a god, one of them is a messenger. They have gotten together. Mainstream media is marketing them. And unfortunately, we have the gullible people who are saying, again, I'm going to do my hallelujah <laughs> move over here. Uh, uh, no, yeah, no, I, go yeah, ahead, I James. couldn't agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree more with what you're saying there. I mean, it is it is ridiculous the the, the pedestal that these people are put on, and uh, and that it doesn't it doesn't even mean that uh, that we have to be um, uh, negative or vicious in our attacks. We just have to be yeah. critical about what they're doing and what they're saying, and hold them to the same standards that we would hold anyone else. And uh, yeah, so I agree with that. But but let's not be coy about it, and let's put all the chips on the table because I think a lot of people would argue that the reason that they support Greenwald is because in the past he has done some excellent and very strong reporting on a number of sure. issues, whether yeah. it be drone strikes or, or what have you. He has been one of the few voices out there talking about some of these issues and pushing them to the fore, doing so in a very cogent and intelligent and articulate and informed manner. So why would we throw him under the bus at the first sign of some, some importunity? Yeah, I think I just made that word up. Um, but, but See, I um, keep laughing. <laughs> point, sorry. point is well made. Sorry, no more, no more humor. Um, but uh, you have intimated in the past that there are things, there are areas that Greenwald will not go into with his reporting. And I would like to hear more about that if you have any specifics that you can point people to about the, the areas that Greenwald does not talk about, specifically does not talk about and avoids in his reporting. My pleasure, and I will give you documented information as well. Many, many witnesses, documents, emails, articles, so they can go check on that. And, uh, and you're absolutely right with the point you made, James, and the fact that has he written some incredibly wonderful sounding stuff, you know? 
I tell you what, Obama did too. Obama wrote a goddamn book on Constitution, okay? It's about this thing, and you be you become a believer, okay? If you didn't know Obama and what he's been doing, and he's a constitutional lawyer, just like Glenn Greenwald, maybe going and studying constitutional law does something, you know, in some way bastardize people. I have no idea what's going on. Because John Yu of the Justice Department, who screwed people, Okay, and screw the Constitution was a constitutional scholar too. So maybe there is some kind of a correlation here. You become constitutional scholar, you go screw Constitution. Maybe there is, maybe there is not. Maybe we have to find more data to see if we can establish that correlation. Anyhow, uh, that was meant to be a kind of a sarcasm here. But <laughs> yes, he did write some great stuff. And guess what? If you go and look at Boiling Frog's post nightly news in the past four or five years, you will see that some of his articles were published, the titles, and they were linked when he was in Salon or even Guardian. And when it needed applaud, I would have to say, hey, I applauded him. That, together with a lot of things that actually were censured by him, a lot of good things that were attacked by him, and, and I will name a few here. One is he became and he was declared as the foremost author, pundit, columnist, or uh, commentator on the state secrets privilege, okay? State secrets privilege that nobody really knew about, and I was one of the first victims during George W. Bush 2002. I received the state secrets privilege invocation not once, but twice. One in 9-11 case, one was in my whistleblowing case. So uh, Glenn Greenwald has written more on state secrets privilege than anybody else, so I admit to it, right? And in many of his writings, Glenn Greenwald actually says, I'm going to provide you with the history. All the cases where state secrets privilege have been known to be invoked, okay? So this is what he's been doing. And, it, and people, I invite you to go and search all the archives. You get all his, and you're going to find more than dozens of articles. Dozens of analysis on state secrets privilege. Glenn Greenwald starts with the historical case, Reynolds case, the first state secrets privilege invocation in 1950s, okay? Late 1940s or early 1950s in Reynolds case. He's saying this is, the, this is when it was invoked. And then it was abused by George W. Bush. And then he goes through all these cases of Al-Hamdi and Al-Masri and all the people who were actually considered labeled terrorist wrongfully by the administration, but all Arabic names, right? That's it. If you go and look, you will not find, and he always says, I'm going to provide you with the history. He actually fudged and censures the history. He took out all the American cases in the state secrets privilege. So that means the state <laughs> Okay, you caught me with signaling my control room. Um, so we have enough time. Basically, She's starting to talk about how um, it was very convenient for Greenwald when he was writing about those security letters, which are basically a way of the uh, the king, you know, we call him president, but he this is a kingly uh, privilege where he gets to write whatever order he wants on these national security letters and other people. But anyway, you aren't allowed to know what they say. You have to obey them and you can't even talk to a lawyer about them. Well, anyway, I guess it was convenient for Greenwald to omit the times when it was used against Americans. Uh, but the Jeremy Scahill, uh, who was going to go into partnership with Greenwald and the PayPal owner to make this new alternative media, Jeremy Scahill, as I was saying uh, from Democracy Now!, he's got this background of being paid by the CIA through the Ford Foundation and so on, and, and you know, it makes it very suspicious. So now here's a little three minute clip where we talk about Jeremy Scahill's uh, shortcomings. Welcome, this is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. Dirty Wars is the title of a new documentary film released earlier this month claiming to document the covert U.S. actions in Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, and elsewhere in the name of the phony War on Terror. Narrated by and starring Nation-slash-Democracy Now! alumnus Jeremy Scahill, 
It is co-produced by Anthony Arnov and Brenda Coughlin, and directed by Richard Rowley, and its trailer gives a hint of its slick, modern Hollywood docudrama sensibility. I got a strange phone call. Someone from the inside was reaching out to me. Someone close to the heart of the president's elite force. There are hundreds of covert operations on multiple continents with the full support of the White House. It's hard to say when this story began. Greetings from Kabul, Afghanistan. This was supposed to be the front line in the war on terror. What's the name of this village out here? But I knew I was missing the story. There was another war hidden in the shadows. The documentary has already won raves, predictably enough, from Scahill's colleagues at The Nation and Democracy Now!, as well as other sympathetic, progressive outlets. It has even brought Scahill himself a certain level of celebrity in mainstream circles, something that a cursory glance at Scahill's Twitter feed is enough to confirm is greatly important to him. That feed containing many more photos of the celebrities that he meets and hangs out with than news or information about the dirty war he is supposedly documenting. His mainstream pop culture icon status was cemented during his recent appearance on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I stole some cookies recently from, we were staying in the same hotel in San Francisco and your room was next to mine and they had some cookies and I took some. <laughs> <laughs> but is Skay Hill's documentary worthy of the endless praise that is being heaped on it? Sadly, according to researchers like Douglas Valentine in his scathing review of the film, Dirty Wars and the Cinema of Self-Indulgence, the answer is a resounding no. As its critics, few and far between as they may be, have been at pains to point out, the documentary fails to explore the meaning or history of the phrase it has taken for its title, Dirty Wars, or examine the people and the agency which has had the biggest hand in conducting these operations in the past, the CIA. You've been watching an excerpt of this week's eye-opener report. To continue watching the report, please log into BoilingFrogsPost.com. Okay, well, welcome back. We aren't going to play any more clips. I, uh, I think you get the idea about that. Now, this is the last show of 2013. And as you can see here, uh, it's, uh, well, free speech zone. And here's the phone number right here. Oops, right there. <laughs> okay, I'm doing like the weatherman, not, not as well. But... Uh, 288-4448, if you want to call up and make a comment before the end of the year, now's your time. we got about six minutes left. In the meantime, um, I want to say something about Jeremy Scahill. I've really enjoyed his work. I mean, he's done some excellent work. But just keep in mind, I mean, no matter who you're talking about, you have to know their biases and their motivations and their financial uh, background. So, you know, just keep in mind that the Ford Foundation and other economic arms of the uh, intelligence agencies are paying for his services. And he's required, under the conditions of those payments, to, you know, basically toe the line. Um, just like Amy Goodman. That's why Amy Goodman won't talk about 9-11, which was obviously a CIA and other agency type of event. And Jeremy Scahill's reporting of Afghanistan and Iraq has the same type of shortcomings. Like, uh, he doesn't mention the, the intelligence connections with Al-Qaeda or the Muslim Brotherhood, which would be CIA and MI6 respectively. So this Arab Spring that you saw was completely engineered by Western intelligence agencies. Um, these are not just state crimes against democracy. These are state crimes against humanity. Um, I want to remind everybody that we'll be weekly starting in January. We're going to, well, starting Sunday, the, that's tomorrow, the, after we reach, what, 8 o'clock tomorrow night, the studio closes down until the 2nd of January. And anyway, every Saturday in 2014, you'll see 9-11 was an inside job. By the way, uh, you've, you've watched me grow this beard for the last three months. I was trying to be ready to be Santa Claus. And uh, when I went to the Christmas dinner that, that I was going to be Santa Claus at, uh, I was kind of shut down. 
apparently Santa Claus is a conflict of interest with Christianity. I was told it was pagan. And I didn't have the, I, well, I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I mean, Christmas is pagan. Let's be, let's be honest about it. It was, uh, the pagans had the, the popular support and the Christians uh, were wondering how do we get you know, the public on our side. So they usurped the pagan holiday at the, at the time of the pagan holiday and combined Christmas uh, with the pagan rituals that were already going on. But when it comes right down to it, I wasn't trying to promote Santa Claus as a living, actual being. I was trying to promote Santa Claus as just something that kids like, you know. And I'm not even sure that's a good idea. But what do you think? Well, the next time you see me in January, I'm going to be clean cut. I, I can hardly wait to get this beard off. I, I didn't want the beard. <laughs> anyway, that's not exactly a good subject for the end of my show. But... We've got lots of things to think about as we go into the new year. Like, don't let your representatives disregard your will, especially when, you know, 80% of the population is on your side and your representatives still, you know, keep making legislation for the corporate elite. I mean, get it in your head that our government is not working for us. The story that they give us is just a cover story. And the fact is that they're transferring more wealth from the middle class and lower to the rich than ever before in history. And it was hypocrisy to the maximum if you watched, it was on TV this morning when I had breakfast at the restaurant, uh, Obama giving his speech about the staggering inequity between the lowest and the highest incomes. The low, uh, uh, I just couldn't believe it. You know, Obama has talked a great line. Every speech he gives, we all agree with. If only he would do what he says, sometime, anytime. And there are still apologists for Obama that say, oh, they're just stopping him from doing it. He can't do it. His hands are tied. He can't fight the government. Those are all lies that people tell themselves. Those people that still support Obama... Do you want to be known as an idiot, as a fool, as, as a person who would, you know, vote against his own best interests? It's amazing. And if you criticize Obama, you're a racist, according to Oprah. Well, it's got nothing to do with racism. I, I was thrilled that a black man could finally break through the, what you call the, the glass ceiling that, <laughs> that, you know, minorities and women usually struck on the way up and it was wonderful to see that but you got to realize <clears throat> that was a calculated gambit knowing that the public was ready for that it was a way to shuffle somebody in under your nose without you even questioning it you didn't do any investigation you were looking for a messiah and you found one and from there on anybody who says anything different is a racist. Well, that's what I have to say here in 2013, and I'll see you in 2014. Have a, have a good one.